Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the FIDE Candidates 2022. There are eight players, 14 rounds, and the winner will play Magnus Carlsen in a world championship match, or the top two finishers will play a match against each other to be crowned the best player in the world. After nine rounds of action and a couple of rest days, Yanni Pomnishi is in clear first place with a one-point lead. There is a link in the description if you want to check out the standings and all of the games. Um, and it's really up to the rest of the field to now catch up to Jan. Jan begins round 10. Uh, and by the way, someone stop him. I mean, if you don't know who I'm talking about, it's probably Jan. Um, yeah, Jan's gonna run away with this thing. Like, and we gotta slow it. We gotta slow him down or else this tournament is gonna be over one week before the actual ending date. Now, um, there was also a perfect game played in this recap. So we got, a, we got a lot of stuff on our plate. So, uh, Jan begins with D4 against Rajabov and he actually goes for a Catalan. Now, I don't know the last time I saw Jan play a Catalan. Like, if we go all the way to the top, make a drop, like, it, E4 is what Jan plays. Like, Jan's an E4 player. Like, he just plays the movie 4. <laughs> um, he played it every game of the World Championship match. So it's very interesting to see that Jan is going for a Catalan. I mean, it's a very harmless, of course. Uh, uh, well, no, no. I, I suppose it, it's, it, it's harmless to change your repertoire to Catalan at top level because there's not a lot of lines. Uh, and, you know, we have like a super, super kind of classical uh, position, uh, dc4, and now we have queen c2. And here the main line uh, is a6. And the idea of a6 is to meet the move queen takes pawn with b5 hitting the queen and then putting the bishop on this diagonal, at which point black has very comfortably equalized the position. Uh, but of course, white can continue to ask questions with bishop f4, you know, bringing the rook, etc. Uh, but Rajabov plays this move b5. Now, the interesting thing about the move b5 is that uh, Nepo played it himself. Nepo actually played this in the World Championship match. I think, I'm not, I'm not sure about the pioneer status of the move B5, but also if you look at the database, there's a guy there, uh, and his last name is Nakamura, and uh, Hikaru has played this quite a bit with black as well. Uh, the line used to be A4, B4, and then Knight F to D2, targeting this and this at the same time. There's this, you know, black can get this pawn, but white has like a very powerful initiative with, you know, this or knight d2, knight b3, whatever. Uh, but in this game, there's a new line now, bishop b7. Now, bishop b7 is a goofy line, and the amazing thing about this move is Nepo has played this himself as well. So, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe these guys have worked on it together. That's just a theory. I mean, it could be a completely incorrect assumption. I, I, honestly, they might literally never speak. But it's funny that both of them are very familiar with this line. So the point is this, a, b, and now a6. And now you cannot take on c4 still because I would hit your queen and your rook at the same time. And after knight c3, we have uh, an exchange, right? And for a brief moment, white is going to be uh, winning the c4 pawn. Like, if black plays the move c5 here, for example, then after queen, well, like dc5, then if you just play a bunch of moves out, white is just up a pawn. And we saw Magnus win a game like this, I believe. I don't remember against who. I, it might have been against Nepo, but I swear Magnus recently won a game. Let me know in the comments. You know what I'm talking about. Norway chess. I swear. W wasn't it Magnus with white? Was it... Who was it with black? Was it Rajabov? Was it Rajabov who played this line with black against Mac? I don't remember. But you guys let me know in the comments. But in this game, Rajabov's like, no. As a matter of fact, you cannot have my pawn. He, he does not let Nepo take it. Bishop f4, and now black just tries to kind of chip away at the center and then activates the queen. Very tense position, again, for a very brief half a move. Uh, white is a pawn up, but white can't really guard this because the knight is hanging, and if the knight tries to go here and block this attack, then, I mean, you, you, right? So, so we have the knight back and queen c5, and basically, if the b and c pawns disappear, this is simply a draw because if the pawns vanish, this entire rectangle of pawns, and frankly, of the entire board, is gone. 32 squares no longer matter, which is crazy because that is half the board. The only reason those squares matter right now is because of the size of pawns. And when you have pawns, you might have weaknesses, right? Like if, if white just shuffles back and forth, let's just... Black, the craziest thing is black can't even go rook b8 because the bishop is here. But let's just say black can like put a rook on the b file, okay? Like this is why pawns matter, you see? Because this is how sides create counterplay or queen b6 or whatever. But there is... The pawns completely cancel each other out in this case, right? And Jan can try to play this for something, and you, you do see he is creating a threat, right? Every PC has a bishop d5, and I mean, Rajabov's not going anywhere. And now Jan takes uh, and plays knight e5. A new attack has emerged, but the knight just goes back and defends. This might be Jan's best position of the game. 
uh, as he has the bishop pair and potentially very good pressure, right? Knight 8, d7. But I think, uh, I think maybe here there was like an opportunity for him maybe not to bring his queen to the middle. For example, instead of queen e4, maybe he can focus on the a file and try to like play a very, very long-term endgame. But uh, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. And instead, we have trades, we have trades, we have trades, and uh, it's a complete draw. And after queen b7... Uh, yeah, I mean, the players just shuffled their bishops back and forth to the corners of the board, repeated moves, and made a draw. Now, this is effortless for Jan. I mean, he's, he's the last, like, couple of rounds, he has literally shown up and drawn in an hour and a half and, and gone back to his hotel room and, you know, watched the newest Gotham recap. I don't know what Jan does in his spare, uh, spare time, played some Hearthstone, Dota, just chilling. He, he actually gave an interview today, and I think he was asked by Nereditsky something along the lines of, uh... You know, like what? Like, give us uh, feedback on your tournament, and Jan's like, "I'm just, I'm, I'm excited for it to end." That's what he said. So, I mean, he's ready to go. He's ready to, to wrap it up uh, and go home. Well, it's important that we take a look uh, at the guy uh, directly behind him, who is Fabiano Caruana, uh, who's obviously coming off a loss uh, uh, against uh, Hikaru a couple of rounds ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he, he's, looking to, um, he's looking to bounce back against Duda. Now, Duda's the only one in the event so far that hasn't won a game. And uh, people are already uh, shoveling dirt on the grave, if you know what I'm saying. But beware. Okay, so we have, a, we have an Italian. And here Duda already makes his first error. He does not play the Evans Gambit, which is just a disaster. He also doesn't play the Max Lang kind of attack or Gambit. Instead, he plays just, you know, simple Gioco Pianissimo stuff. A6, A4, very common. If you pay attention to these uh, Italian games, you know that, well, that, that, that doesn't happen. But, um, but uh, I thought the dog came into the room. <laughs> That's why I started looking back. I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I'm just going nuts. You know, you own a pet or you have, I'm sure we have the parents in the chat, uh, in the... <sighs> In the comments, not in the chat. In the chat is what you say on Twitch, Gotham, you bozo. I'm sure some of you have raised a small thing. You just start hearing noises or seeing them places, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you've been watching these Italians, there's a lot of different uh, queenside expansions. Black plays A5 or white expands like this. Uh, not, again, not the most important thing in the world. Fabiano offers this exchange. And this is obviously Fabiano's idea, right? I mean, like, he wants to play this position for a win, so he's going to try to move his knight out of the way, which he does right now. Um, now, what's funny is that Fabiano once had this position with white against a guy named Alexander Grishuk, and he lost that game with white. So Fabi's like, oh, I kind of like that. You know, I'm going to go queen f6, g5, it's a, in the future. And, well, you can see from his next move, it's, he's made it very clear he's attacking. Now, the funny thing is, like, visually, this looks incredible for black, right? Just as a human being, you're like, oh my gosh, the queen's going to come to g6, h5, g ba 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 this bishop is a beast. But white is completely fine here. And like, if black is not careful, white will play b5, white will play d4, and ask about the integrity of your entire position, because it looks good, you know? It's, it looks good, but is it really that good? It's like a, like a guy with big muscles, you know, not, not me, I, I'm just wearing a tight shirt, but like a guy with big muscles, can he actually fight though? You know what I mean? Like, is he actually tough? You know, it's one of those things, right? Queen f6, again, not talking about me. Uh, bishop takes f4, queen f4, and you'll notice, I mean, Fabi's just all in. Like, if Fabi has not made this clear, like, he, he's just, he's going for mate. But again, I asked you a couple of moves ago, what are you going to do about b5? Like, when b5 happens, what's happening? Because you can't take it. You really can't. You cannot paralyze two pieces. The bishop can't move, because this is defended. The rook can't move, because the bishop can't move. Like... Black is dead if this happens. Like, do you understand? Like, white could even do this. Now you are entombed permanently. I mean, white will just go knight e3, knight h5. I mean, try to move this knight, trap your queen. So, knight goes to a5, but when is this knight ever returning back to the game? When? It's like in permanent jail on a5, right? Fabi tries to throw a couple of punches here. I mean, it's very clear what Fabi's trying to do. He's trying to win the game with black against the guy that hasn't won a game yet. And catch Nepo, all right? Because Fabi will be half a point away from Nepo if he wins this game. He's got to go for it. Queen back to f6. Rook g7. Now, rook g7 is a weird move. You might say, why didn't he go rook f8? I actually can't tell you. He decided to go rook g7, I suppose, because uh, there was this idea. Maybe there was this idea from Dudu. Like, takes, takes, and, you know, just getting his rook down here. Just in the future. In general. Which is why Fabi decided to go rook g7 and potentially triple up. 
Um, so we have King H1, Rook F8. And like everything Black has done has indicated that he wants to launch a giant attack and absolutely smash Duda, right? Duda says, who, me? Oh, you trying... Oh, you're trying to smash? Oh, oh, my bad. I didn't realize because I'm going to take this real quick and now I'm going to hit you with my with the pawn in front of my own king. You think you're attacking me? I'm attacking you. Here are the options for black. If you play g4, the knight cozies up on g5. Who's, who's guarding this? See, I have an active knight. You got this clown over here on a5, the lame horse, all right, in the stable. They're gonna have to put that horse down. That, that, that horse is not going anywhere. It, it ain't racing at Epsom anytime soon. I, I've been watching Peaky Blinders. On, I just, listen, just making, just making my references over, okay? Just let it rock. I mean, this is coming. So Fabi can't do that. He tries to open things up, but again, Uno reverse. Who's attacking who? You got 19 points barreling down this way. Guess what? I got 16 points of defense. And your queen cannot lead the charge, folks. If your queen is leading the attack into a defended setup, it's not going to work because your queen can't take anything, right? So Fabi's got to find a way to make his other pieces go. So he plays bishop c5, rook g1, bishop d6. At this point also, Fabi's really low on time. And you've noticed nine points of material just got transferred this way. And this knight is still not participating. At some point it might. Queen g6, rook up to d3 and potentially swing over. We have AB5. Look at this move. He's not even acknowledging this. He's got this bulldozer. Queen back to E8. The advantage is like plus six now. If Duda finds knight E6. That move just wins because after rook G3, rook G3, there's queen to H5 ideas. But after AB5, uh, rook to F6 is played. And there's a really funny move somewhere around here. Um, queen F1. What, what, what you're about to see is Duda playing checkers. Watch this. Queen F1. Queen g2, queen h3. What? Queen f1, queen g2. So Duda could have just landed a knockout punch with knight takes e6. He, he slow plays it, and Fabiano has now kind of built up resistance. Because again, the whole like uno reverse happened over here. Um, we have, I apologize, we have rook 1g2, knight b7, and Duda now goes for a savage move. Knight to, oh my goodness. If you take this knight with anything, my rooks just smash down here. If you take this, I play knight takes f6, and if you take my queen, that's mate, my friend. That's mate. That's mate on g8. Yes, I should be a rapper. Knight to h7 is amazing, but you know what's incredible about the move knight h7? It does nothing because black just goes here. And now Duda started shaking his head. Duda so suddenly was like, oh my God, I've messed this up. I got, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? He's gonna get his knight into the game. He's gonna get his bishop into the game. The knight is coming around. The bishop is gonna get my knight out of there. Oh my goodness. And Fabiano blunders the game back immediately. In this position, Fabi had to continue to rotate his knight or maybe play rook g7 covering the f7 square. It's an, basically an impossible position to play with black and it's probably losing no matter what. Fabi plays this, and now Duda plays a beautiful move. I always like to say, if an impossible move is possible, it's probably bad news. Duda plays the move. F4! The last piece that he has yet to move. It took 39 moves for that pawn to get involved in the game, and it cannot be taken. I mean, if you take it with the rook, 96, and you're going to lose material. If you take the pawn with the pawn, there is this amazing clearance sacrifice. The idea is if bishop takes clearance on f3, that knight, that stupid horse that finally found a way back into the game is a decoy, and there is also a threat on h5, and the game simply ends with forced checkmate. Absolutely brutal. Um, actually, it would have been double check and mate. That's just mate. The king is mated. It can't go anywhere, and there's two checks. Savage. So f4, they make the time control, a knight gf3, and that's it. You're going to lose something. And uh, Fabiano tries his best. I mean, he creates a little bit of counterplay on the king. And the most important thing is you have to know how to simplify the game down to a winning endgame. For example, rook and knight versus rook with no pawns is a draw. Rook and knight versus rook and couple of pawns is probably also a draw, but you might actually lose because that person might make a queen. So in this game, we get to this end game, and Duda's winning here for really one reason, and it's that he has this pawn. 
and Duda takes a couple of pawns here. Um, he's not going to win this pawn immediately, but over time, this one will always have the defense of the king or the knight. And that is why on move 57, Fabiano called it a day. And oh my goodness, folks, Fabiano might have called it a tournament. Two losses in his last three games. That's absolutely heartbreaking. And now he's five and a half points. He is one and a half points away from Jan. Some other people might get up to his, uh, his level as well. We're about to take a look at those games. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, just absolutely heartbreaking. Just insane. And the next game uh, that I have for you, actually, I'm going to save the best for last. Uh, I have a game between Report and Ding Li Ren. This is an, I mean, these two, these two provided us two games in this event, which were just legendary. Uh, Report begins with E4, E5 and plays the Kings. No, Knight F3. Everybody wanted him to play the Kings Gambit because he's Report. Like, if you make an odds of who's going to play a Kings Gambit in this event, it's going to be Report. But he, he goes for a Spanish. And we have, um... We have uh, something known as the Arkhangelsk with b5, bishop c5, uh, and a move here that's almost never been played, which is bishop g5, like very few games. There's just no need to move that bishop out there. Like the bishop, you know, usually goes to some squares over here, but that's report for you. And report is trying to be provocative. He wants to see if Ding Li Ren will play this move g5, weakening his king and kicking his bishop around. And Ding Li Ren's like, uh, yeah, I'm gonna play g5, bozo, and I'm gonna go get your bishop. Like, maybe I'm going to take it, but I might also go to f4. So, uh, yeah, Ding Li Ren came to fight. I mean, he is uh, he is ready not to castle, uh, and maybe he won't. Uh, maybe his king will get chased around this, uh, the center of the board, and we're going to have an amazing game. No spoilers, though. Rook b8. Now, this is an incredibly complicated position. Nothing has been traded, so you're looking at pawn breaks from both sides. b4, d4, b4, c4, d5, a knight coming here, maybe f5 in the future, maybe g4, what's gonna happen, right? So king goes to h1, it's a preparatory move, and now we have b4, finally. Nope, still no trades. Bishops to, to b3, 17 moves per player, and nobody has to... Yo, can someone take something, please? This is ridiculous. All right, maybe bishop is gonna go to d5 and take... And then maybe we're going to go d4. I don't know. We're about to find out. All right. But there it is. g4 here. Yo, can somebody take something? Finally, Ding Li Ren has captured a pawn on b4. It took 20 moves. We have our first capture. And now we have our second. Report has absolutely given this pawn away. And the idea was that after knight to e2, he would win some time and get to play the move f4. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. This king is stuck in the middle. I'm about to shred open these diagonals. Let's go. F6. Never play it unless you're Dingley Ren. Takes, takes. Let's also get rid of this knight. Now, this looks really powerful. Bishop coming to F6. Maybe if the queen can get involved on this diagonal as well. Dingley Ren has one move, and that move is rook to F8 defending his pawn. This is completely insane position. Report takes on F6, takes, bishop takes. It looks like Report is just knocking to collect the rent. The king is trying to hide in a little bunker with all the pieces around him. Report's calling for backup, all right? He's got his boys. They're on the way. It's about to be bad news, all right? Somebody tipped off the cops. They're not going to come. I mean, this is just, just really, really bad. But now the queen comes out. She's like, she's, she's, she's got a shotgun. I told you, Peaky Blinders references. I mean, listen, the queen's like, who's messing with the king? Nobody's going to touch him. Report's like... Uh, as a matter of fact, actually, I have a queen of my own, right? Queen on f1, defends on f6. Now here comes Dingley Ren's bishop into the middle of the board, attacking the rook. The rook has... What? Bishop f7, if you take, then this queen discovered check and wins the queen. Oh my goodness, the king goes to d7. What is going on? The king is surrounded by the squad. He's like, yo, y'all better protect me. I am so frail. I am so frail. Now the rook rotates to d1. Rook c2, the bishop backs up, and the rook backs up as well. Are we going to get a repetition of moves? What are you, insane? It's report. He sacks a knight. When faced with the opportunity to potentially repeat moves, I'm not saying black would have repeated moves. He could have taken on b4. But when faced with the prospect of potentially repeating moves, report would instead sacrifice an entire knight. Report did not miss that the pawn could take the knight. He just wanted... To open up his rook and the bishop on this diagonal, this dude is a lunatic, and we are all here for it. We love it. Report, never change, even at the candidates. This is incredible, all right? Ding Li Ren now has to do something, so he makes a getaway for his king, all right? He has cleared the seventh rank. The king is going to walk over there under some supervision because he's super beta, and he's going to hide. I'm not joking. He is ready to sacrifice the rook entirely. Report takes it and continues to knock on the door. He's ready to arrive. The king is going to get bulldozed, but Report's only got three pieces left, okay? 
And nine times out of 10, two pieces are better than a rook. And right now, bishop and knight for black are better than the rook for white. And it could be an issue. If report doesn't deliver a fatal blow soon, it could be all over. C5, the pawns keep rolling. You can't take it. Queen E6. Look at this, this is completely incredible. B6 check is possible, but the king is safe. The king is getting away. Bishop H4, Bishop C5, and slowly but surely, the pawns are falling. And on move 42, Report made a mistake. In this position, Report had to play a danger levels move. He had to give away his bishop. Okay? For the knight. And have this. And apparently this, th th this position is equal. Because the king will hide, but black doesn't have enough material to mate my king. Okay, just incredible. Um, instead of that, he played this move and now got his queen hit with tempo. And the bad thing about this position is, even though he can win the knight, like his entire idea was to attack the knight and take it and win the knight, Ding Li Ren correctly realized that this endgame is actually lost for white. Why? Because the bishop cannot successfully wrap around and play a role in the game. If the bishop goes to e7, then after this and this, white is an irreparable damage with the b-pawn passing and the king coming. And what, what ends up happening ultimately is an opposite colored bishop endgame where white's king is literally falling off of a cliff over here. It's going to take the king ages to get over there, and he's unable to. Black is just much faster, and the king shoulders the white king away. The bishop will also cut off some squares and potentially win a couple of pawns in the process. And uh, yeah, Ding Li Ren wins an absolutely insane game of chess. You just got to give credit to Report. Like, Report's the type of mixed martial artist who might lose decisions sometimes, but both guys are going to have, like, closed eyes. They're going to, like, be bloodied up, except chess is not a physical game. So, you know, Report doesn't have to worry about long-term, like, physical damage and CTE and all this stuff. He just has to worry about emotional damage. All right? Emotion. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So... King d3, b3, this is on the way, and uh, Ding Li Ren's uh, in third place. Uh, Ding Li Ren is tied for second. Y'all thought he was done. Uh-uh-uh. And maybe he can actually stop him. And now, let's look at our perfect game of the day. A near-perfect game. And... Hikaru plays e4 against Ferrucia. We have c5. And we have a Knight Orf Sicilian after six moves. There are many lines here. Hikaru plays the classical, ultra-popular bishop to e3, and generally what develops here is black chooses between e6 and e5. e6 is Scheveningen. I never know how to pronounce that. Please don't yell at me. Uh, and then there's also e5. And traditional knight orfs, the knight goes to b3, white castles long, players, you know, take off their gloves that they were never wearing and then punch each other in the face. But Hikaru plays knight f3. This is a much calmer knight orf. And generally what happens here is white will put a bishop on c4 and fight for the d5 square. Black will, you know, develop the pieces like this. The main line is something like bishop e7, bishop c4, castles, ca but not king f1, maybe bishop e6, bishop d3, bishop b3, and something like this. Knight c6, knight a5. In this game, Ferrugia plays knight c6 very early. I'm not really sure why that move matters, because he kind of immediately plays bishop e6 anyway. But now Hikaru spends a bit of time and plays knight d5. Knight d5 is going to send the game into very specific territory because the threat is bishop to b6 and knight c7, right? If black just takes on d5, white goes here and white continues to have like a very nice grasp of the d5 square. This is like positionally what white wants, which is why black plays rook c8. And now Hikaru takes on f6. And after queen to f6, I really wonder what the idea was. Um, probably he would have taken, because there's, I don't really feel like there's a point of going here. This just allows black to play queen g6. I kind of figured, you know, maybe he'll take. Black can maybe take with f or e or something like this. And uh, castles, and, and we play chess. You know, we have a three on two on the queen side. Black will maybe try to get something going here. That bishop is a little bit sus. Um, but Ali Reza breaks all opening principles and takes with the pawn. Now, when you take with the pawn, it's a very clear indication that you would like to go here and maybe mate your opponent in the future, right? Which is all the more surprising why Hikaru castles directly into that. Ali Reza takes on b3. Hikaru follows principles of capturing back toward the center. Maybe c4 in the future. For example, if black plays rook g8, there could be c4 and black is going to really struggle to play this d5 move, which means black will have to play for f5, right? That's kind of the other pawn break. If black doesn't get either of those things, 
black is positionally suffering forever. Um, so that is why Ferruja plays d5 right away. Hikaru does not trade queens. Okay, if you trade queens here, you gave yourself problems for absolutely zero reason. There was no need to be this nice. So he plays queen e2, and now black's queen is going to be a target, as well as the king, which is stuck in the center. And there are a couple of ideas here. After you play c4, you're going to find all the right ways to configure these five pieces. c4, then you're going to figure it out. So knight f5. Here goes rook d1, and here goes c4, right? Bishop g7. That is a depressing place for a bishop, stuck behind two pawns. And it's like... Ali Reza played g takes f6 a long time ago, and you would think it was to play rook g8, but now it seems like the way Hikaru has played this against him, he's gonna have to castle anyway, which is like, but what about the structure? Right? It was an interesting idea at the time, but now it's like, ah, man, those pawns. You kind of wish you could, like, move one of them, you know, or, or, or move the bishop out this way. So Hikaru plays rook d5 with pressure this way and potentially doubling and tripling, right? So he doubles. And now black will not be in time to trade. So Hikaru dominates the only open file. Very, very good principles of chess. Black plays rook to e8. And now here comes h3, preparatory move for something, b5. This was the computer's only complaint of the entire game. Here it wanted Hikaru to play bishop c5 and it claims black has no moves. It just, it, it just like, like for example, if black plays just like a random move, you can play b4. And then, like, for example, if black plays a random move, like, well, actually, king h7 is not a random move because then there's queen e4. But the idea is basically g4, queen e4, black has nothing. Like, black is completely lost. Hikaru plays a slightly modified version, which is c5, and it's still a question of where does black move? Well, apparently, black can get some counterplay with a5, okay? Um, which is why bishop c5, like, there is no a5 because of this. Right, so bishop c5 is like the only small complaint, but the computer can shut up. Again, computer's like, computer is the kid in the back of the class that reminds the teacher that she never checked the homework. All right, you remember those kids? Like, shh, shh, bro, she didn't check the homework. Be quiet. Uh, excuse me, miss, you didn't check the... No. Treated like a mosquito out here. No. All right, that's what stockfish is. And what does Hikaru do here? Locks in the pawn on c5. Uh, Ali Reza looks for a little bit of complication here. But, uh, yeah, Hikaru just sacks a rook. Hikaru gives away the rook and glues the knight into f5. This is an incredible move. The point is here that relative value of pieces is important. This is a one and a half point bishop tops. It will never, ever see the light of day again. This is a four and a half point knight, okay? The rook's about a five pointer. Both of these are, you know, doing their jobs, but... The truth is that once the queen gets over here, that's a 15-point piece, right? This queen could stand around this way. It goes here, but now queen h5, and here Hikaru finds a beautiful idea. Hikaru knows the game is over, so he sets the pieces up for the next game and plays the move rook a1. This is so savage. He knows the game is over, so he's like, I'm just going to set the board up. Rook a1. And the idea of this move is rook a3, rook g3 after clearing out the bishop. And the game ends with an absolutely brutal display of violence. And on move 32, Firuja resigns because you cannot stop mate. Queen g7, queen f8, you can even take a pawn with check. You cannot stop mate. Nobody can get to g7 in time. And that knight on f5 is now a 20,000 point knight, okay? A beautiful positional game from Hikaru Nakamura. Gorgeous. Got nothing to say. He's tied for second place with Fabiano Caruana and Ding Li Ren with five and a half. Someone, please stop Yan Nipomnishi. I will see you all for round number 11. Get out of here.